Well, good evening or good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we've just opened the room, so it's just going to take a little while for a few people to, uh, to filter in. Uh, so give us a moment and we'll be right with you. All right, well, we, we might get ourselves underway. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to a fantastic event that we've got this afternoon for you. Uh, if you can see Dr. Richard Stevenson's screen, you'll be able to see a fantastic picture of Antarctica, and we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Richard Stevenson and also Dr. Gareth Andrews, who are taking on, as the screen says, the last great first, uh, crossing uh, on uh, skis across Antarctica, uh, the last great first, uh, appealing to that sense of adventure that it's the, the last great thing that hasn't been accomplished as yet. Uh, the two gentlemen are very experienced polar explorers, uh, having been uh, uh, involved in many expeditions over the last decade and have just recently returned from working uh, the British angle of, to all of this in the NHS uh, through the COVID crisis and are now back in the Southern Hemisphere preparing for this great adventure they're about to undertake. I don't know if you saw it uh, in the weekend uh, Australian, but there was a, a great article uh, on, their, on their trip. Uh, I strongly recommend uh, getting a copy of that. Uh, there was a link into it in our weekly newsletter this week. Uh, so please feel free to avail yourselves of that. Uh, just in terms of some quick housekeeping, uh, the format today is fairly simple. I'm going to pass to Gareth in a moment uh, and Gareth and Richard will provide a presentation for about 20 minutes or so, uh, 25 minutes or so, and then we'll have uh, some Q&A. So please use the Q&A feature uh, through Zoom to put your questions in. I'll get through uh, putting as many of those as I can to uh, Gareth and Richard. Um, we've also got Mark Richardson, who's uh, on, online this afternoon with us, who's helping to uh, finance and bring together the sponsorship and other requirements uh, in the background so that these two gentlemen can successfully take on this monumental and mammoth task of crossing uh, a continent on skis. Um, just quickly before I pass to Gareth, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, our, our members and sponsors on the call today, in particular our, prin our principal sponsors, including Accenture, HSBC, Len Lease and Mott McDonald. Um, it's always important to have sponsors and, uh, and these two gentlemen amongst uh, uh, many good causes uh, are looking for sponsorship. So if you have the opportunity to, uh, after this, to um, participate and, and support their program, please let us know. We'll pass you, your, your details on to Mark and make sure that we can support them any which way we can. Uh, so without any further ado, Dr. Gareth Andrews, I'll pass to you to kick off the proceedings. Thank you. Just going to bring up my slides. First of all, I'd like to say a big thank you for David and everyone at the Australian British Chamber of Commerce for all your support um, for the expedition so far. Um, everyone, Rich and I, and everyone at the Last Great First are delighted to be speaking to to you all. So, um, good afternoon and, and good morning. Um, so, what Rich and I and our team are, are attempting to do is to become the first people in history to ski across the entire continent of Antarctica unsupported from coast to coast under human power alone. Um, and over the next 25 minutes we want to take you through the planning and preparation that, it's, that it takes to, to put together an expedition like this. Um, and also to, to tell you how we've been building our team pretty much over the last 10 years. So starting off with a, with a brief overview of the expedition and the route, and we'll get into more details about Antarctica and, uh, and the route itself later in the presentation. But it's a journey of 2,600 kilometers. Uh, we expect it to take approximately 100, uh, 110 days. And we plan on starting from the Bay of Wales. And the, the polar historians um, amongst you will 
recognize that name as being the start point for Roald Amundsen's, Amundsen's expedition to the South Pole, uh, becoming the first man to, um, or the first team to reach the South Pole. From the Bay of Wales, we'll ski across the Ross Ice Shelf to the base of the Transantarctic Mountains. And from here, we'll forge a new route up, uh, up a glacier that's never been explored before. So never set foot on by a person before, um, en route to the Polar Plateau. Once on the Polar Plateau, we'll make our way to the South Pole. And from there, we'll turn north again and head to Gould Bay um, on, the, on the coast of the Ron Ice Shelf. And in doing so, um, we'll have everything we need to survive in our sleds that will uh, weigh approximately 200 kilos. And the burning question that, that all, always gets asked at this point is, is why? And, um, and for us, it's, it's multifactorial. Um, there's the chance to achieve something that's never been done before, to push the boundaries of, of human endurance and human resilience. But also there's a tremendous amount of good that, that can come of, of um, this crossing and this, um, and this expedition. Working with Scouts Australia, we have the chance to inspire a generation of young people to, um, to protect Antarctica now and into the future. With the Healthcare Workers Foundation, Rich and I have been working on the front line of the pandemic response for the last 18 months or the, or the last um, 15 months. And, um, and we've witnessed firsthand the, the courage and the bravery that, uh, that healthcare workers across the world have shown in the face of tremendous adversity and it's our, our small uh, contribution to, to helping them. And then on to, on to climate um, through the Antarctic Science Foundation and supported by the Australian Geographic Society, we've got a real opportunity to uh, make a significant contribution to climate change science. Um, so from here, I'm gonna hand over to Rich, who's gonna tell you a little bit more about Antarctica. Uh, thank, thanks, Gareth. So um, yeah, so we're just gonna to start to sort of get into the, the meat of what it is that we're planning to do. Um, and I think it probably helps just to talk a little bit about Antarctica, the, the continent itself that, that, that Gareth and I are, are so, so obsessed with. Um, just a bit of basic orientation to begin with. So you can see at the top left hand side of your screen is the Antarctic Peninsula there. Uh, and that points up towards the tip of South America, which is just off just off the, uh, the corner of the map that you can see here. And at the bottom of the map in front of you, you've got the Ross Ice Shelf and the Ross Sea. Uh, and that's the sort of the face of Antarctica, if you like, that points towards uh, New Zealand and Australia, where we are. Um, and Antarctica itself is, it can be thought of really as two enormous ice sheets, um, the largest of which, and uh, which is by far the largest ice sheet by several orders of magnitude in the world, which is the, the East Antarctic ice sheet, makes up the mass of the continent. And then to the west, you have the smaller West Antarctic ice sheet, which then flows into the Antarctic Peninsula. You can see the South Pole marked there that sits on the East Antarctic ice shelf itself. And the two other really important features of the uh, Antarctic continent are its permanent ice shelves. If, if you wouldn't mind just flicking forward for me there, Gareth. So you can see here that um, you have on the bottom of your screen the Ross ice shelf and the top the Ronnie, Ronnie Filchner ice shelf. The thing I want to emphasize about these ice shelves, they're, they're really incredible, unique features of Antarctica, and they're, they're glacier ice. So this is freshwater ice. This is, this is ice that fell originally as snow thousands of years ago onto the Antarctic uh, ice shelves and has slowly flown through the enormous glaciers that drain these shelves into the ocean, but has then spread out over the ocean and is floating to a certain extent over the ocean itself. These, are, these essentially form an extension of the Antarctic continent. They're permanent features. They've been there for hundreds of thousands of years. And, and, they, and the edge of these ice shells really marks the true extent of the Antarctic continent. And that's very important for, for our expedition. You can see those red lines there because they mark the true, mark rather the true coast of Antarctica. Around the Antarctic continent is the seasonal sea ice and that's saltwater ice, frozen seawater that contracts and expands uh, as, as the seasons progress. But those ice shelves are permanent features and, are as, and really as much a part of the Antarctic continent as, as, as the ice shelf and the land itself. 
And the other feature I'd point out there is a Trans-Antarctic Mountains. This is a, 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 a more than a thousand, two thousand kilometer long chain of mountains that marks the boundary between the Ross Ice Shelf uh, and the, the central East Antarctica Ice Plateau. Uh, and we'll talk a bit more about that when we go into the details of our route later on. So looking at, at some polar history and, and um, the first man to conceive of a crossing of the Antarctic continent was Sir Ernest Shackleton. Um, and the eagle-eyed among you will, will notice that this, uh, this dinner party sketch um, from Shackleton himself uh, is actually upside down, but it's only to, to orientate us to the, to the uh, accepted orientation of Antarctica with the, um, with the Antarctic Peninsula at the top and South America at the top of the screen and New Zealand at the bottom. And essentially Shackleton um, put together a, a, an expedition that would, that would form a pincer movement. So Shackleton in, himself would sail into the Weddell Sea uh, in the Endurance's ship, the Endurance, and start from the Weddell Sea side of Antarctica en route to the South Pole. His other team would start on the opposite side of the continent on the Ross, in the Ross Sea and lay depots towards the South Pole for when Shackleton reached the opposite side of the continent. But as the story goes and is so well known and ma many of you will know it, the Endurance was um, was stuck in the ice in the Weddell Sea and eventually crushed and lost. Um, and uh, Shackleton's men essentially escaped to Elephant Island and then and then on to and then on to South Georgia, becoming one of the greatest stories of adventure, bravery, and um, leadership in in adversity um, in history. So it wasn't until then. Uh, it wasn't until, until 1957-58 when Sir Vivian Fuchs and uh, Sir Edmund Hillary made the first true crossing of Antarctica um, in motor, motorised vehicles. Fuchs starting from uh, the Shackleton base on the first of the ice shelf and uh, Hillary starting um, uh, from Scott base. I'm sorry, that's the, that's the other way around. Um, but essentially the first crossing of Antarctica in any form. And here's that, the, one of the iconic photographs from the, from the expedition of one of their trans-Antarctic tractors teetering on the, uh, on the edge of a huge crevasse. So teams before us um, have started on the, on the very edge of the Ron Ice Shelf um, in the Weddell Sea, gone via the South Pole and ended their expeditions at the bottom of the trans-Antarctic mountains. Um, and we endeavour to go 700 kilometres further um, and complete the first full uh, true crossing. So um, I think now is a good time for us to talk a little bit more about the route and, and some of the conditions that we expect to, to find along the way. Um, so we'll start imagining us from the Bay of Wales down the bottom of your picture there on the coast of the Ross Ice Shelf. And the first 700 or so kilometers is going to be dead straight across the Ross Ice Shelf. And this is, this, you know, it's floating freshwater ice, it's flat, and, and, and essentially um, this, is, this is at sea level. Um, we're starting our expedition, you know, really very early in the Antarctic season because it's such a long expedition. We need as much, as much time to get across uh, as we can. Um, but that presents some of its own challenges. There's, it's reasonably likely um, but there, we could encounter some quite soft snow on the Ross Ice Shelf. And if you can imagine, soft snow is not the, not the friend of somebody trying to ski, pulling an incredibly heavy sled along behind them. So our sled digging into the snow is going to be one of the great challenges that we face across the Ross Ice Shelf. Um, conditions there will be you know, relatively warm, you know, maybe ambient air temperatures of, of perhaps minus 10. Um, and, and, and that really changes very significantly um, as we hit the foot of the Transantarctic Mountains. Now, as Gareth said, um, the, we would like to forge a new route through the Transantarctic Mountains. This is a, a long chain of mountains with these vast glaciers flowing down through them that act as the drainage of the East Antarctic ice, ice sheet. And um, these kilometers are, sorry, these glaciers are 100 kilometers long, long and tens of kilometers wide and essentially form these great ramps at which you can travel to get from the Ross Ice Shelf at sea level up onto the polar plateau on the top of the East Antarctic ice sheet. Um, 
it, it's worth saying that Antarctica as a continent, you know, there's a lot of superlatives associated with it, and, and, and quite rightly so. It's the, it's the coldest continent on Earth. It's the, it's the windiest continent on Earth. But also, that might surprise some people, it's also the, the highest continent on Earth. Um, the polar plateau sits at around 3,000 meters. So it's really quite a significant altitude. As, as we make our way up through the glacier onto the, onto the polar plateau, that's where conditions become, I guess, what's sometimes classically associated with Antarctica. It'll be, it can be very windy. The, the, the wind tends to go from the South Pole outwards, so we'll have a headwind for the entire first half of the expedition. We're high, we've got 3,000 meters, so it's much colder and altitude is a factor. And we're on to hard ice that's been sculpted by the wind into these incredible little sharp, solid ridge lines called sastrugi, which are formations on the ice, which can be very challenging things to drag the sled over. When we hit the South Pole, things kind of reverse a little bit and we'll be moving with the wind behind us ever so slightly downhill as we head towards the Ronnie Ice Shelf, uh, heading north with our backs to the South Pole. Is a less dramatic transition from, from the ice shelf on to sea level uh, going in this direction. And we'll travel on the Ronnie Ice Shelf and we'll actually travel over an island, a, a huge island called Berkner Island, uh, and we'll reach the true coastline of it there. And, that, and that's to avoid some particularly difficult terrain that we know forms within the ice shelves as they, as they flow around Berkner Island. And then hopefully we'll reach the, the, the coastline of the Weddell Sea um, some 100, 110 days later and 2,600 kilometres later. Um, and, and be the first people to cross uh, unsupported on skis across the entire continent of Antarctica. It, it, it's worth briefly mentioning the PEX classification is the logo of which is at the bottom of the screen there, and that's the polar expedition classification system, and that's recently been introduced by a man called Eric Phillips, who's the, is the president of the International Polar Guides Society, or association rather, uh, and, and that's really a way of categorizing polar expeditions. Um, and, and when we say unsupported, we choose our words very carefully. Unsupported means that we start everything, uh, start the expedition with everything we've got and we end with exactly the same things. There'll be no support on the way, will be no resupplies, we'll be taking everything with us. We won't be using any of the smooth um, uh, kind of ice roads that exist around there for the resupply of the American base at the pole. And we have to do the entire thing totally independently. Uh, and a full crossing means that coast to coast, that true coastline that's so a fundamentally important part of what makes this expedition so special from the borders of the Ross Ice Shelf to the Ronnie Ice Shelf from the true coast to coast. And we'll be doing it all on skis under a manpower itself. And um, you may have come across people using kites in Antarctica to, to travel using the wind. And uh, we won't be doing that. We'll be doing everything using manpower and, and pulling the sleds behind us using, the, using those muscles in our legs essentially to get us across the continent. It's worth just mentioning the scale of Antarctica, because I think it's sometimes it's quite hard to appreciate. So that's Antarctica with, with, with Europe superimposed upon it. Um, and so the, the distance that we're proposing to ski is essentially the equivalent of going from London or, or, or Cardiff um, to, to, to Moscow. Um, you can see that line we've drawn on there. So that just gives you a sense of the scale of Antarctica. It's, a, it's an enormous place. Um, and so how did we get here? How did we get to the point where we thought that we were in a position to take on a challenge of such magnitude? Uh, this is a photograph of, uh, of Rich and I at the source of the Skalfanderflot River in, in Iceland. Um, and it's been, you know, it's been a 10 year process um, of expeditions and, and training and building our team. Uh, that's brought us to this point. And this is a, this is a photo of our, in our preferred, you know, a, a environment outside. And, um, and this is our sort of our day to day and our reality at the moment um, in, in PPE and hospitals. Um, so it was around eight years ago that um, Rich and I signed up for our first major expedition to the magnetic North Pole. And it was here sitting in a tent um, somewhere in the middle of the Arctic Ocean that, um, you know, we'd be in because it was our first proper adventure together and, um, and we were really just getting to know each other at that stage and it was there that we um, realised we had, we both had this, um, this, this, uh, this goal of, of crossing Antarctica one day and it was really here that the, 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 the project was born all those years ago. 
And since then, um, you know, we've 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 really developed into a into a very close knit, very professional team, um, and we've been through some pretty demanding, sticky situations together. This is it's just one of them. This is a couple of polar bear prints from uh, from the high Arctic. One one night. Um, about 2 a.m. We're somewhere near the magnetic North Pole. We're sitting in our tents and uh, we hear some rustling around uh, around the tents. And uh, we had lots of Arctic foxes come and visit our, our tents. And we just thought, oh, maybe it's just a fox. And then we heard a spade fall over and one of our sleds get pushed to the side and some deep bear-like breathing. So we sat, sat bolt upright in our tents, just listening to this bear shuffle around. And eventually it just it just went it just went away and neither of us were game game enough to stick our heads out of the tent but when we got up in the morning there were these big dinner plate sized footprints all, all around our tent um so it's these these experiences over the years that have that have really brought us closer together as a team um and then to greenland um and a crossing of the greenland ice sheet um which is the is the second largest ice sheet in the world outside of Antarctica, and it was here that we uh, really started to hone our our, our, our skills in, in polar travel. Um, our most recent expedition together was was to Iceland, and this is one that we did in April of twenty nineteen. Um, and uh, this photograph here shows our rafts at the start of the Skalfandaflot, which is at one of Iceland's major rivers. And, and this was an expedition to cross unsupported across Iceland um, using skis and pack rafts, which is, is something that had never been done before. And um, by polar standards, it was a pretty, pretty short expedition, only, only a mere 300 kilometers and you know, it took us about 16 days. But it was, it was a very challenging expedition. The Icelandic terrain is incredibly tough. Um, and we were determined to do this unsupported, so carrying everything with us that we needed. Uh, and and it, was a, it was a very strange expedition. We were skiing, pulling sleds, we were walking, carrying everything on our backs, and we were paddling uh, in, our, in, our, in our inflatable rafts down rapids um, in, in, through snowstorms. And, and that was 50 kilograms of gear there once it was all sort of uh, packed up that we had to carry on our backs for certain, for certain stretches. So that's our most recent expedition. Um, and, and that was a very tough and, and challenging expedition that, that helped prepare us mentally and physically for what we're going to be undertaking in Antarctica. Um, Gareth and I, you know, we've, we've, you know, we cut our teeth together in the Magnetic North Pole expedition, which was well, back in 2013 now, um, eight years ago, and that's where we really got to know each other. And we've, we've realized over that time doing, you know, major expeditions and, and smaller, you know, smaller trips within, within particularly the New Zealand mountains together, but we make an, we make an excellent team. Um, we, you know, we, we happen to be brother-in-laws. I'm, my partner is Gareth's sister, uh, and luckily we happen to get on very well as well. And, an absolutely key component of an expedition like this. We've got to spend 100, 110 days in each other's company in a tiny little space um, going through the, the hardest physical uh, challenge that we're ever going to undertake in our lives. And so the way that we interact as a team has got to be absolutely rock solid. And, and one of the things that make Gareth and I so strong as a team is that we've thoroughly tested that relationship over several years. You know, we know that we have a similar attitude to adversity. We know that when one of us is having a bad day or being a bit low, that the other can, you know, can rise to that challenge and, and have a good day and be the optimistic and encouraging one that day. And, and those roles can be reversed the next day. Um, we, we bring complementary skills to both the organization of an expedition and, and technical skills when, once we're out there on the ice or in the mountains. Um, and, and that really, that, that the way that we work together as a team forms the, the absolute basis for this expedition. If we weren't such a good team, um, it, there's no way that we would be able to pull off an expedition like this. Yeah, ab and, you know, absolutely. And, um, and I think the, you know, the fundamental thing is that our team between the two of us is based on trust and respect um, and um, and you know it, on expeditions like this especially the really long ones um, you need you need a teammate that is caring and respectful um, to be able to to deal with uh, with the adversity that you're no doubt going to going to experience so, but where do you start planning an expedition that is so audacious? Um, well, 
you know, you speak to the experts, um, you speak to people that have gone before. As Rich mentioned, um, we're working very closely with, with Eric Phillips, um, who is the president of the International Polar Guides Association. Um, he's become not only our Antarctic expert, but a mentor and friend, um, incredibly knowledgeable. And, um, you know, and through Eric, we've scrutinized maps and satellite images. And, um, and you know, the big question is, you know, why do we think we will be successful where, where other teams have changed, uh, have failed? And, and I think it, um, the answer lies in meticulous planning and attention to detail. So I guess what a lot of you will be wondering, you know, what, what constitutes a day on the ice? What, what does a polar, polar day look like? You know, fundamentally, our, our goal every day is to cover as much distance as we possibly can. You know, we need to be covering, you know, nearly 26 kilometers a day. Um, and so the, so the day really revolves around how far can you move your sled um, and where do you get your water and your warmth from, really? So we'll wake up at about six o'clock in the morning and we'll spend the first couple of hours of the day uh, melting snow and ice to provide our drinking water for, for the day. Um, come kind of eight o'clock, we'll get out of the tent, we'll, we'll pack our tent away uh, and we'll set off skiing. And you fall into with sort of this the classic rhythm of the polar day. So we'll ski for a set period of time, perhaps an hour and a half. Um, and then we'll have a short break. And it's important these breaks are only very short because as you can imagine, temperature regula regulation in this sort of environment is quite challenging. You get cold really quickly if you stop for any length of time. So rather than having you know, a lunch break, for example, every hour and a half we'll have these short breaks, we'll take on some food, we'll take on some fluids, and then we'll set off again. So it's quite a regimented structure. And then we'll repeat that cycle five or six times a day uh, until we get to the end of the day when we'll make, put our tent up as far as we've got we'll get into the tent as quick as possible and we'll spend the next few hours going through a routine of repair, rest uh, and boiling uh, and melting more snow and, uh, and ice for, for, our, for our dinner and for our food for the, and, and water for the next day. Um, and the key component of this and making this sustainable it, to allow us to survive for such a long period of time through this, this rigorous regime is rest. It's really important we get enough sleep really important that we just have some time off our feet so essentially if we're not skiing we want to be lying down doing as little as possible and resting and sleeping as much as possible and uh, approaching an expedition like this it's um you know, it's 80 percent mental um 20 percent physical yes you've got to be strong enough to to haul this big sled um, but it's it's comes down to mental resilience at the end of the day. So we've been spending a lot of a lot of time working on mental strategies um, and, and adopting a mindset that um, that puts us in a position that we are, you know, we're in Antarctica for three and a half months, which is a, an extremely long time. So we've shifted our mindset from the fact that we have to get from one side to the other rather that we're gonna be living and existing in this environment for that amount of time. Our little red tent is gonna be our home. And once you make that shift, um, it makes a, it plays a big difference, uh, uh, makes a big difference psychologically. But on a day-to-day -day basis, adaptive coping, uh, positive adaptive coping strategies are key. So the way that you approach adversity, control the controllables, um, so, for example, if, if we get stuck in a tent by a polar storm for five days or in the middle of a crevasse field, that means that we lose time and distance and, you know, it's dangerous, all these things by adapting positive coping strategy to this, to the, the adversity, um, uh, puts you at a much, much greater um, advantage. But of course, you know, there's only so much mental preparation that you can do. And as I said, if you can't actually physically move your 200 kilo sled, then um, then you're never going to get anywhere. And so we've been going with Joe Bonington uh, here in Sydney um, at Joe's base camp. He's been putting us through a rigorous um, 18 month training program. We've been hauling heavy tires up and down beaches 
we've been lifting heavy weights in the gym, trying to put on some bulk and some mass. So we've got some both strength, but also some some mass to lose um, on the expedition because we know undoubtedly will lose weight. Um, and training through through COVID and in lockdown has has also been a challenge. This is um, this is the back lane of our act in Cardiff. I'm back in Sydney now, but um, but I spent many hours uh, dragging this tire with these with these old uh, with these old weights on it up and down the, up and down the lane. And um, it, training is always better with with some company, and that's my kids sitting sitting on the tire. I'm, um, you know, I, I guess one of the absolutely fun key components of an expedition like this, and I, I'm sort of watching some of the, the chat questions come through as, as we go, and I'm looking forward to the Q&A at the end, but the, the, we, what we're doing is absolutely the edge of what is humanly possible. There's very good reasons that this has not been done before, um, because it's really difficult. And so if we're going to be successful, we have to be absolutely meticulous about every single little thing that we do. And that goes to all of our equipment and our gear, our personal equipment, our sleds, our skis, our, our, our tent, um, the absolute minutiae of what we take with us, um, our food, huge amounts of preparation goes into just optimizing every single facet of the expedition uh, and to exploit all advances in modern technology and communications and gear and equipment and materials technology that we can to try and make this thing possible. Um, I'm slightly aware that we're getting very really tight for time, so I might move over the equipment section reasonably quickly, um, and we, I'm, I'm more than happy to, some, to field some questions uh, about uh, all the different aspects of our gear later if, if we have the time, um, because obviously Gareth and I are, are passionate equipment nerds and we could spend hours going on about these things, but uh, I know we're a bit tight for time, so we'll maybe, I'll maybe let Gareth move on to the next section. So I think one of the important points we wanted to talk about was um, being able to perform at our best um, when we're at our worst. At, at the end of a, a hard, long day, dragging heavy sleds and you're fatigued, and you've still got to put your camp up, and the wind is blowing, you can't, you can't hear or see each other, it's blizzard conditions. Um, and this is where it's so important to have trained and to have worked together over a long period of time, like Rich and I have, and developed our systems and our safety systems specifically. So we can, you know, we can get our camp up in under five minutes in, in every condition and, um, and in the worst conditions to be able to communicate with each other. And this comes down to, again, to preparation. So spending hours putting up and taking down the tent. Um, and then also, um, other aspects of our training. So this is our crevasse rescue training. And we've been looking at um, something called the stress inoculation theory, where you basically you put yourself in stressful situations, you develop, a, develop strategies to, um, to cope with those situations. Um, so you can apply them if they actually happen. So not only the technical, but also the psychological. Um, so when it comes to Antarctica, um, and heaven forbid, if, it, if we happen to fall into a crevasse, we can say to ourselves, we've been, it's okay, we've been here before, we know what to do. Uh, and this, you know, that point can be applied ac across um, a whole range of different, different as aspects of the expedition. Um, and I've seen, I've noticed in the in the in the Q and A that there's a huge number of questions about food. Um, I, I, essentially, we're working with a company called Firepot, which is a, a British-based company that that makes, you know, as far as we're concerned, the best expedition food in the world, and we've used it on previous expeditions. And and they're they're a fantastic company who are making bespoke meals for us to to provide us with. Uh, these are all freeze-dried um, meals, well, or dried rather dehydrated meals that are uh, bespoke. At, to us that will meet not only our calorific uh, requirements, but also over such an incredibly long expedition, they need to meet all the macro and micronutrient expedition. You know, this, is, this expedition is plenty long enough to get scurvy um, if we don't have any vitamin C in our diet. And, and so the, the, the detail of the planning and the food is, is, is incredibly important, both pre-expedition and during the expedition itself. And Firepot are providing us with both breakfast, dinner, and at each of those rest stops that we talked about on our polar routine, we'll have a little pouch and um, that'll, that'll have 
um, some food in it that will provide us with just the right amount of, of calories, macro, micronutrients, glucose, um, longer acting uh, carbohydrates, slow release carbohydrates that we need to get us through the next hour and a half of skiing. Um, and I'm, I'm more than happy to answer a few other questions once we get to the Q&A, uh, particularly around food, because as, as you've rightly identified, it's, it's incredibly important. And so, look, in a short presentation, it's really difficult to address all the areas that we'd really like to in enough detail. So we'd love to get through to the Q&A and, um, and, uh, and, uh, and answer some of your questions. But in finishing, you know, I think, as I mentioned before, the, if we're successful in this expedition, the reasons will be meticulous planning, um, you know, our physical and mental preparation, um, but most of all, surrounding ourselves by positive, positive minded individuals. We've got a, an incredible management team behind us um, supporting us all the way. And, um, and that really will make, um, will make the difference between success and failure. We're just going to show um, a short video and then, uh, and then we'll get on to uh, the Q&A. We're attempting to be the first team in history to ski across the entire continent of Antarctica unsupported. It's on the brink of what's humanly possible. We'll have everything that we need to survive for three and a half months in our sleds to cover 2,600 kilometers. This will not only be the first completely unsupported ski crossing of Antarctica, it will also be the longest unsupported ski expedition in polar history. Since 2013, when we skied together to the magnetic North Pole, this has been our big goal. Our friendship is based on trust and respect and it forms the basis of our team. We need to be strong enough and endurance fit enough to drag a 200 kilo sled 10 hours a day. Rich and I are passionate adventurers, but first and foremost, we're doctors. So we put the expedition to one side to put all our time and focus to our patients and our colleagues and our families through what's been a very challenging period. We have the opportunity to achieve something that no one has ever achieved before, to push the boundaries of what's possible, to inspire a generation of young adventurers to chase what they're most passionate about. And through hard work, determination, resilience, they can achieve whatever they set out. The more money we raise, the more support we can give to the Antarctic Science Foundation and to the Scouts for the heroes of today and the youth of tomorrow. We look forward to you joining our expedition family and thank you for your support. Well, thank you very much, guys. That was a terrific presentation. Um, I'm particularly uh, pleased to see there's a lot of uh, questions in the in the Q and A, and I look forward to uh, to getting to those in a moment. But I'd love to start with um, uh, the first question for me is: You're going to travel an awfully long way, day after day, week after week, literally month after month. Blisters chafing, uh, you know, just the fact that there is no place just to take all your kit off and have a hot shower at any point in time. How do you, how do you mentally prepare yourself for the physicality and, and the challenges that come with that sort of repeated exercise over that sort of period of time? I think it comes from, um, a lot comes from experience. Um, of having having done it many times before, but never never for this long. Um, but we have all these strategies, coping strategies that we can employ to, uh, you know, to prevent these things. Um, and the other thing is, you know, doing the training beforehand. It's not just training to drag a sled. It's also training so you don't break down. No, training so your ligaments and your joints are strong and your stabilizing muscles are strong. So you don't get up though, you don't pick up those little niggles and those little, you know, those aches and pains that can become debilitating and, and really sap your, um, you know, sap your enthusiasm. And I think Rich and I have a real advantage 
being doctors, um, you know, blister prevention, musculoskeletal injuries, chest and skin infections, these are the things that, that end expeditions, um, especially long ones like this. And, uh, and I think we have an advantage of being able to, you know, predict and treat and, um, and, and diagnose um, before they become a problem. And I think you're quite right, David, to, to identify the, the sort of the, the gradual repetitive nature of, of, of what we're doing and the, and the risk of deterioration. And of, and of course, there will be significant deterioration over the course of such a long expedition. But really, the way that we're approaching something like this, you know, the, the absolute definition of an ultra endurance polar expedition is that we have to learn and prepare to essentially just live in Antarctica for what will seem like an indefinite period of time. You know, if we go into this thinking, right, that's one kilometer gone, you know, 2,599 to go, you know, we're not, we're, that's not going to go well. You know, we have to, we have to enjoy being out there. We have to, that has to become our life. Um, essentially, and it has to almost feel like this is just something we could just keep doing if we had to. And that's very much not only the mental mindset that we're going into this with, but also how we're preparing ahead of time to just to minimize as much as possible all of those little niggly things that can build up significantly over time. The, the other question that I was particularly interested in, it really probably came to me most actually in that short video you showed at the end there where, you know, everybody sort of, I guess, thinks about the crevasse, the, the, the problem that could come from a crevasse, but you're skiing on, it's not like skiing at Threadbow and Perisher or, or at any of the great ski resorts of the world. You're, you're basically skiing across how it is, across thousands of kilometers. Uh, of, of uncharted, you know, potentially potholes, you know, effectively. How do you, how does that actually feel? How much of it is actually in your experience so far doing the magnetic North Pole and, and Iceland and so on, how much of it is actually reasonably straightforward, but it's just a lot of it? And how much of it is, there's quite a lot of challenging terrain for periods of, you know, maybe days in this, in this, uh, venture that you're taking on I, I guess there's you know I would say you know 90 odd percent of it is essentially skiing in a in a fairly straight line over quite repetitive terrain and that will vary at those sort of key points that we we talked about when we were talking about as a sort of the different phases of the route if you like mm. but there will be really quite specific key moments probably one of those big ones is as we cross through the transantarctic mountains up up one of those great drainage glaciers and and particularly given that we'd like to to, to forge a new route up a, up a glacier that's never been traversed before and um, you know we're using a huge amount of satellite mapping to go into a huge amount of detail and that you know modern technology is really quite impressive um, as to what you know subsurface mapping can be can be done using radar and things but there's always going to be unknowns and so that's probably a key area where you know the crevasse danger will be potentially real that the route might be quite convoluted and wiggly as we as we have to make decisions on the ground as we go about what constitutes safe terrain uh, to get us through technical sections and then probably the other thing is once we're up on the polar plateau, the Sastrugi that I mentioned before, and that you can get into these great fields of Sastrugi that may or may not actually be running parallel to the direction you're trying to travel. So if you're trying to travel across them, it can be really quite difficult. And that can be a very, that can be potentially very challenging if we're, if we're um, trying to cross a Sastrugi field for, as you say, potentially days on end. Um, where you're having to think about every movement and everything's jerky and awkward and you can't get into your rhythm and those are probably the two areas that we would identify as, as the biggest uh, uh biggest challenge in terms of the technical detail of the terrain and the route yeah and just uh, um, one other thing you know they're the areas that we're most concerned about um you know in terms of um immediate danger um but you know it's the days out on the polar plateau the the, the the days where the conditions never change you're just adrift on this big flat white ocean essentially and um you know it has its own challenges no you're not you're probably not gonna you know fall into anything nasty but it's it's where the it's that's where the mental toughness comes in 
I, I asked before we started tonight uh, how much of this is just purely about preparation, understanding the risks that you're taking on and, and how much of it is just being kind of just a little bit nuts. And uh, Gareth, you gave me a pretty strong answer of 80-20 and, and I have to say I took it as 80% uh, you know, managing the risk and 20% nuts, but I think you corrected me on that. Is, is that still how you say it? You mentioned 80% mental. Is that really, is, is, is that all it is, being able to get up and just carry on, build that teamwork, get, get each other going? That, that's, it. that's exactly what it is. You know, it's, um, it's being able to get out of your sleeping bag every day. You know, every day you'll get a shower of ice down the back of your neck when you, uh, when you brush up against the tent. You know, you have to chip the ice off the zip on your sleeping bag. You have to light light the stove when it's minus forty. All these things every you know every day, and um, you know that's that's the hardest bit. But you know what? When you've got you know when you've got a good person next to you, and um, and the it's it never becomes more apparent the you know the power of a smile, like a, and a positive attitude. Just it just changes the whole outlook. And, um, and that's what it is. It's the mental game of, you know, having little processes every morning that said that, that get you back up and on your feet and pulling that sled. Um, that, um, you know, that's, that's the most important bit of the, the whole expedition, just getting, getting out every day and doing the same thing every day. And, and learning to enjoy it, learning to enjoy being in this you know, absolutely incredible environments. And that lies at the nub of, of why Gareth and I are doing this, is because we want to we want to experience Antarctica in its rawest and its purest form. And, and who can think of a, a more raw and pure form than, than doing this? And, you know, that's what drives all of this. It's about being in these incredible wilderness environments and these harsh conditions that just put you, you know, there's something very pure about the existence where you don't worry about your mortgage. You don't have to worry about dropping your kids off at school at football at the time and how you're going to get to the supermarket before it's time to pick them back up again. You know, the stuff that occupies most of us most of the time. Suddenly things are about staying warm, um, getting shelter, getting food, getting to your camp for the night. And, and actually, in many respects, that's a very, it's quite a psychologically peaceful frame of mind to be in for a long period of time. And it's, you know, that really what drives Gareth and I is, is, the, uh, what it's like to be on expedition in the wilderness. So just touching on that, um, there's a great question here. Uh, Antarctic expeditions are known for being exposed to severe storms and being locked in the tent for days. Does your plan daily target account for this? I know that there's a little bit of bandwidth and you talked about that in your presentation about a little bit of a bandwidth to get through everything. What do, you, what do you do? Do you take a deck of cards and you know, play poker, do you get pretty good at reading each other's poker face after a while? Or <laughs> how do you pass time when you're when you're stuck in a tent? We uh we can't we can't spare the the weight for a pack of cards. Oh. So um oh look there's there's all sorts of there's all, all sorts of different things. You know and the beauty of 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 modern modern exploration is that you you still have your smart devices um you know charged by solar power so we'll be listening we'll be able to listen to music and and read and and, the, and those sorts of things um but i think the you know the fundamental point around around that is that we have this is the expedition is right on the edge of what's possible um you know some people don't think it's possible at all um you know we've got 110 days to cover 200 2600 kilometers um you know, our, our window of sort of our, our buffer is that is that 10 days. Um, because, you know, essentially that is the entire Antarctic summer that can be serviced by search and rescue that we have to complete this. We don't have any more time. Um, so yeah, look, if we get stuck in, in our tent for, um, for days on end that it starts chipping into our final total. Um, and to put it in sort of, um, perspective expedition teams will will go will trek anywhere between 
you know, 15 and, and 30 kilometers a day in, in polar environments. And so 26 kilometers a day with 200 kilo sleds at the start, um, you know, it's, it's a massive undertaking. Um, and um, and something that that's that's why we're preparing so and training so hard for it. Mm. Mm. Um, there's a question here from Diane around, and and I want to come back to that search and rescue piece that you just touched on there. But um, a question from Diane around: uh, Do you leave anything behind? I mean, clearly, you know, you need room and those sorts of things. She she mentions toilet paper um, being left behind. Um, I assume that you, you, you kind of try and minimally uh, impact the environment as you go through this. How does, it, how does it work out? You just mentioned you start with a 200 kilo sled. What does it wind up with at the end? Is the last bit a bit easier because you've only got 50 or 60 kilos left? How does, how does it stack out? Go on, go on Rich. Sorry, mate. Um, yes, I mean, look, essentially, what you leave behind is human waste. And you don't leave any other waste behind. I mean, and, and that's that's so there's, there's a couple of key components. That's I mean, to be honest, the by far the most important component of that is the fact that that's our moral obligation to the Antarctic wilderness to keep it as pristine as possible. Um, whether or it also happens to be part of the, the definition of, of unsupported is that you don't leave rubbish behind you as you go so we don't you know all those packets of, of food once they're eaten they get flattened um and stuck back in a sledge you know we'd never be leaving um, deposits of rubbish behind us um, and and quite rightly that's built into the definition because every one of us that goes to antarctica plays an incredibly important part in keeping it this pristine wilderness and, and you know we'd never countenance any other other way of doing it quite frankly but it so um as, as we go along, we obviously eat food at a, at a predictable rate. And, and the other big, I mean, essentially the vast majority of, our, of the weight that we're carrying is not equipment, it's food and fuel. And um, we will burn fuel and we'll eat food as we go. And, and so, you're, yeah, you're absolutely quite right. Quite right. As we go, our sleds will get lighter. Um, and when we say we need to cover 26 kilometers a day, that's an average. So at the beginning of the expedition, if we have deep snow um, and we've got 180 200 kilo sleds we probably won't make 26 kilometers a day and we might not make 26 kilometers a day going uphill through difficult terrain um through the transantarctic mountains but towards the end of the expedition as we've got a tailwind this is a ever so slight downward gradient and our sleds get lighter then we'll we'll, we'll be needing to compensate for that and go more than 26 kilometers a day so um uh you know that's how things will kind of vary naturally as we go there's a, there's a lot of people who are worried that you might get hurt halfway or something goes wrong. You do get stuck in the tent for more than 10 days uh, and, and things start getting out of control. What, what is the rescue plan? How does that work? So, um, you know, a lot of our time is spent developing our rescue plan and it's, you know, it's multi-layered. Um, so the logistics company that fly us into Antarctica also provides search and rescue services. They're based at a place called Union Glacier on the Ron Filchner ice shelf. Um, and they have aircraft positioned around Antarctica. The most remote part of our expedition will be at the Bay of Wales in the very start point. So one of the reasons why we've opted to start there is because we're essentially walking or skiing back towards safety towards you know safety at the south pole and then towards the ronnie felsner ice shelf and safety at union glaciers so they can um, fly planes out of there so and within our within our plan um you know there's daily satellite communications with uh with the team at union glacier and, and our base camp team our last great first base camp team um, and one of the interesting points is that we will phone every day and have a voice conversation with the team at Union Glacier, not just to tell them how we're doing, but a lot can be um, inferred from a conversation and the tone of voice and the and um, and and so they use that as a way just to just to see how you're ticking along. If we miss a phone call, um, then an alarm bell goes off. If we miss two phone calls in a row, so two days in a row, uh, and they've had no communication from us, then they will send an aeroplane to our last known location. 
Um, so all the rescue will be done by a fixed wing aircraft. Um, there's only one section um, of around 40 or 50 kilometers in the Transantarctic mountains on this unexplored glacier that they probably won't be able to land a plane because of crevasses. Um, but in that case, then they will land a small team who will come in on foot to, to, to um, put together a rescue. The rest of the route is all accessible by aircraft, but that comes with the caveat that the weather is good enough. Um, you know, so they have to be able to fly and land a plane. And if we're in a remote area of say the Ross Ice Shelf, you, you're looking at three different weather systems that they may have to fly through to get there. So there are all, you know, we plan and plan and plan for, you know, all eventualities, but you know, there are some things that are outside our control. I've got a question here from Tiki Fullerton who wrote that great piece that was in the uh, the Weekend Australia magazine. She uh, she hints at the fact that both of you guys are 39 and you're going to have a birthday during this process uh, out there on the ice. You've already told us there's no room for a deck of cards. I'm tipping uh, a little bottle of scotch isn't going to be, uh, you, know, un uh, you know, tipped out at the right time. <laughs> we'll see. Pro look, prob probably we've got Christmas as well, so we're, we've been work we're talking to the guys at Firepot about how to how to how to fit a um, how to de dehydrate a birthday cake and stick it in one of those uh, those meal packets. I did, well, did I notice treats snuck along um, as we as we go definitely for birthdays and for Christmas. Yeah. Did, did I notice that one of the the um, the, the packages from, uh, from said posh pork? Is there such a thing as posh pork? Posh posh pork and beans. Yeah, yeah, it's really, it's really, yeah, it's really good. Great, that's one of our favourite yeah. flavours. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant, Brilliant. Uh, can I uh, just turn it, turning to a, a little bit more practicality again, rather than uh, a little bit of frivolity, perhaps? Um, with um, with COVID and and everything else that's going on in the world around us. Um, are there any challenges for you? Obviously, I mean, you're effectively choosing to self-isolate for three months um, as you <laughs> as you cross the the, the the continent. But how hard has it been getting things together and and assembling the the team? You know, the support crew, getting to being able to get from here from from the UK to here and from here to Antarctica is is all of that sort of coming together as easily or is it much more difficult? What's the what's that meant for you guys in, in this process? Yeah, I mean, look, as you know, it's 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 almost impossible to underestimate the impact COVID is having on on everything these days. And, and the same goes for for expedition planning. I mean, you know, we'd we'd probably be a year ahead of where we are now in terms of our planning and preparation if if it wasn't for COVID. And, you know, on a personal level, as as, as doctors you know, particularly Gareth being back in, in the UK for the height of its COVID um, uh, sort of pandemic, you know, we had to drop everything and, and just concentrate on, on, on doing our day job. Um, and, you know, the, the global supply chain of, of everything is, is very challenging at the moment. International shipping is, is I'm sure I don't need to tell your members about this, but the, you know, international shipping is, is, is a considerable challenge. Everything's delayed and everything's unpredictable and that's quite challenging. And the supply of raw materials is a challenge because all of the equipment that we're taking is very high end niche equipment that's only manufactured in certain parts of the world by quite specialist people and specialist equipment. But raw materials is quite a challenge. So, you know, it's, it's affected every step of the expedition. Um, and um, you know, so there's been days, I have to say, where sometimes the idea of pulling a 200 kilo sled feels like it will be an awful lot easier than trying to manage the logistics of, of an, a transantarctic expedition, you know, at the tail end, touch wood, of a, of a, of a global pandemic. All right, I've got. To, I've, I re really recognise that we're coming up to six o'clock uh, here in uh, on the east coast of Australia. I know others are in New Zealand, in in the UK, and elsewhere um, joining us as well. So I'm keen to to wrap up, but I'm I'm going to see if we can steal five minutes more for five quick questions. First one is five. Well, the question here asks, what are your five favourite pieces of kit? Let's go for top three. Uh, Gareth, do you want to start us off? Top three bits of kit. Um, favorite bits of kits, gloves. Um, you know, warm set of Hestra guide gloves, spot on. They'll be they'll be your best friend. 
I'll go for I'll go for stove because it's the you know it's the thing that warms your tent up in those freezing mornings and when you finally get in the tent at night and get your stove on and get a brew on, um, you know that's a, that's a magical moment. Brilliant. And number three, it's got to, it's got to be the tent. Um, you know, it's your little um, it's your home, it's your survival cell. Um, it's just a lot of fun being in tents. Um, and and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a vital bit of kit, and it's one that we've sort of agonised over um, about you know which ones to take and design and all, and all that stuff. So yeah, fundamental. Uh, I'll drop in one more. I'll drop in a fourth. That's that's my earphones and my and my uh, whatever it's going to be, music or or podcast playing device. We're going to get through an awful lot of audio books <laughs> during this trip, and they're they're going to be pretty important for my sanity. And 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 for number five, a a spoon with a really long handle. Um, sporks, sporks just don't cut it because when you get to the bottom of your pack of food, you get food all over your hand. So you need a spoon with a really long handle. And if you lose your spoon, that's it. That's, that's ex it's expedition ending. Yeah, yeah, no, that's we fire up deeper as soon as the spoon goes missing, don't we? Yeah. Well, make sure you make sure you hang on to those. Do you have a, a wristband for it so you can't drop it in the snow? We'll wear it around our necks the whole trip. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, the last question I, I particularly wanted to ask actually was uh, a great one by Stuart Gleeson. You've been working towards this expedition for the last decade. You, you, you mentioned that earlier. And that obviously is a massive opportunity for you guys to achieve this now. Have you put any thought to what happens next? There's Once you've successfully walked off the ice shelf at the other, you know, you get get to the other end. What happens next? There's um, you know, there's uh, the the brain is always is always ticking. There are um, you know, this is the last great first, but there are other great polar journeys. So um, you know, there's 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 a whole list of things that that we could do. But I I think um, you know, it's that, that immediate time after an expedition is, you know, it's it's the most it's the most difficult that that come down. But um, but I think always having another plan just on the on the back burner is always is always a good one. So hopefully there'll there'll be another one after this. I yeah uh, I, I can't really look past my first proper cup of tea that I'll be having in three and a bit months. So I'll uh, that'll keep me going. It'll be nice to see my kids again, but it'll be even nice to have a. I'll make sure that we don't pass this video on to your family to, to see that. <laughs> that line. We'll, we'll cut that clip out of the, uh, of the recording. Um, look, Gareth, Richard, it's been terrific to, uh, to share some time with you. I think what you're doing is incredible. We've been lucky to have some great adventurers speak to us over the years. Tim Jarvis, who, um, you know, on the scale of nuttiness, uh, recreating the, the epic voyage of Shackleton to get back to South Georgia. Uh, we had Adrian Hayes last year, who's climbed mountains. Uh, to, do, to have you guys to talk to us today has just been truly special. Uh, we wish you all the very best of luck. Um, we know that we need to help you raise some funds as well. And the Chamber is delighted to be able to help uh, support you in that endeavour. And, and uh, I know Mark's doing a, a great job collecting uh, some friends and family, but also some other sponsors around the place. And if anybody on the call uh, this evening wants to, to support them, please, uh, we'll be sending out some details. Get in touch with Mark uh, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll make sure that you guys are well connected to be able to, uh, to support the journey. Um, and they've got some great am ambitions for um, supporting the Scouts and, and the Antarctic as well. So great reason to, to get behind a, a couple of really likely lads to make a, a great journey into a great success. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone, uh, for joining us. Thank you very much to Richard and Gareth for your time. Mark, thank you very much for introducing me to these two guys. What a great, what a great time we're going to have. We look forward to watching uh, your journey unfold. We, we know we can follow where the satellite phone is pinging from as you cross the continent. And, uh, and we very much look forward to seeing you in person uh, once uh, COVID restrictions allow us to do so. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, David, for a wonderful uh, opportunity that you've given us. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, David. It's wonderful to be able to talk to you. Yeah, thank you so much.